All right, so I'm going to get started. Um, my name is James Nelson. I work for Appian Corporation, and I run the nonprofit, well, not for profit yet, We the Internet um, entity. Uh, my talk today is about building a GWT 3.0 app with Java 8, Elemental, JS Interop, and Web Components. So there's a lot of subjects to cover, but um, the Java 8, Elemental, and JS Interop are all fairly concise. So I'll touch on them, give a few examples, but the real meat of this is about the web components. So I'm calling this GWT 3.0. This is my vision of GWT 3.0. So this is a, a prototype application, which is a GWT compiler written in GWT using Polymer elements for the, um, ba the building blocks and then exposed as web components in the browser. So I've decided to kind of retitle the talk Building Modern Web Apps with GWT. So I kind of want to focus on what a modern web app is and whether you really need Java 8, Elemental, JSON Drop, and web components. Um, really, you should be able to pick and choose which tools you want without feeling like you need to use the shiniest, newest thing every single time. So, I'm going to first tell you a little, about, about, little bit about what I do. Um, I work for Appian Corporation. I do a lot of GWT hacking on the side. You might have seen me in the G Plus group. I'm the guy that runs the uh, Java 8 branch, which is basically Ray Cromwell's work with my patches on it. So um, I basically started with GWT in, since 1.4. I've done all sorts of wacky side experiments. Some of them have survived. Other ones have not. Um, I work at Appian Corporation. We do a um, application framework for end users. So we essentially expose a expression language for an end user to code their GUIs in a cross-platform way. So they write one expression with their input fields and their paragraph elements, and we will compile and run that on web, Android, and iOS. So it was rather fortunate that Ray Cromwell mentioned um, hybrid apps earlier today because that's actually what we do. We share Java code that is cross-compiled to Objective-C and also JavaScript. So that way, the core model of our application is all in Java, and which is the primary reason why I think GWT is the number one solution for the application layer of your, of your web apps. It may or may not be the number one solution for the GUI layer, however. Um, a few other things I work on, the XAPI framework is extremely extensible. Cross-platform Java API. Um, basically, it's just a way of doing dependency injection based on what particular platform you're running in, web, Android, iOS. Um, you can read the rest there. Um, basically, I want to talk first a little bit about what makes a regular web app modern, because that's kind of at the core of what a modern GWT application is trying to do. So I kind of want to take a quick step back, um, go over a few points. Mobile support is really number one for a modern app. If you're not supporting mobile, you're missing about half of your clients, or at least half the time they're online. So as you all know, there's a few different options. You can make your regular layout very simple and clean. Um, if you watch the Polymer talk, you'd see that the Polymer elements themselves are very intuitive, where if you create a drawer element, it will collapse for mobile, and you get that for free. Um, there are a lot of existing GWT solutions, which I've linked to. You can grab them from the slides later. And then the native application with feature parity of the website. That isn't what you'd expect a GWT person to recommend, but that's actually what we do at Appian, and we found it works quite well. Um, everything that can be shared is shared, and then our views are written natively for maximum performance, which is very important. As you also saw in the keynote, GWT can outperform hand-coded JavaScript and is only about twice as slow as a JVM. So um, keep that in mind when you're writing your code. If your users think it's slow, they won't like it, they won't stick around. So when you're building your modern web app, don't just start piling every framework under the sun into that, because you're going to wind up downloading three megabytes of, of junk before you get to load anything on the page. You all know that, but I'm reinforcing it so that you know. Um, something that some people have missed, performance.now, super, super important. Nanosecond resolution, so you can actually measure how many milliseconds, how many fractions of a millisecond did something take. Um, next, of course, is your user experience. If your user experience is hard to use, same thing, people aren't going to like it. So when you're designing your GWT web application, users don't care what framework you use. They don't care what it is inside or how cool your linker is or how many code generators you have. All they care about is they click on the button, they get what they asked for. So um, keep that in mind. And last but certainly not least, ease of building, testing, and maintaining. This to me is the most overlooked part of every web application is how hard is it to actually build and run? If it's impossible to build, 
no one's going to touch it. So um, when you start adding new features, for example, all of the experimental stuff I'm giving you, it's kind of hard to build and run. I would not suggest you go out and just start using this tomorrow, but if you're uh, an early adopter and you like to experiment with interesting new technologies, by all means, I will help you get your build running. So a modern web app. Using every new HTML5 feature, don't need it. You can build a modern web app using div soup if you like. So long as it matches these four main points, that's okay. Same thing with frameworks. Don't use, you know, Polymer and Angular and React.js and jQuery and every, like, pick one or two and use the right tool in the right place. So when we're talking about a GWT 3.0 app, what, what does that look like? You know, do you need to use Java 8, Elemental, and JS Interop? Um, these features will make your code cleaner, easier to read, you'll have access to the latest APIs, the type safety. That's nice, but you don't actually need those things. Um, you'll note I left web components out because they actually do provide functionality that you can't get otherwise. Um, more on that later, obviously. So when you're building your modern GWT application, pick the right tools. Don't, don't just use the latest thing because you saw somebody talk about it. Like, assess the value that you get. For example, at Appian, we have an expression editor. So when you want to edit this custom domain-specific language, we have to build an editor for it. Now, would it have been fun for me to build it? Yeah, I would have loved it. Would have been challenging? Of course. Great use of company resources? Not so much. So you gotta take this into account, and when your, um, when your needs call for it, use a JavaScript library. Just because your application is GWT does not mean that everything in your application needs to be built out of GWT. That's what JSON drop is for, actually, is to make it, it's dead simple to just drop Ace Editor into your um, library and start using it right away. No need to write JSON, just describe the interface you want to access, send some variables, works out of the box. Um, don't be afraid of your JavaScript. Um, they're making JSON go away, but they're exposing JavaScript that looks more like Java. So, um, once again, if, if Java is not the right solution, use JavaScript. Um, GWT gives you the best of both. When it comes to um, do not repeat yourself, the, GWT is a unique place in that the code generator is built as a fundamental part of the platform. So for the example project I'm about to show you, almost everything is done as an interface that's been annotated and the code generator takes care of all of the heavy lifting. When you see what the code generator spits out, you, you might get a little scared, but um, Keep in mind that the, more, the simpler it is for you to write, the more work the code generator has to do for you on the back end. So, um, yeah, you know that. If, you have, if it's ugly, fix it. Um, that's fine. Um, final point before I get started. If you still support IE8 like I have to at work, please encourage your, brow your users to stop. Build a little pop-up that says, you're using an ancient browser, please install something better. It, It'll just help this process go faster, so we can all use web components sooner. Um, so, after that little spiel, I'll get into the actual pieces that you came here to see. So, Java 8. Um, how many of you have actually used Java 8 so far in experiments? So, a, a good spattering, I'd say about 10%. Um, so, I'll go quickly over the three main features that GWT will actually leverage most. Um, lambdas are the first thing people think of, and so, the primary thing for here is that if you have a single abstract method in your interface, you can instantiate it automatically just using this lambda expression. So the compiler internally is actually gonna create a new runnable object with your, um, your run method exposed correctly. Um, any kind of functional interface that you have, it will actually, behind the scenes, the JDT compiler generates a class object and GWT itself does the same thing where when you create a Lambda, it will actually create a new instance of an inner class with a bunch of fields that point to your variables. All the work you have had to do yourself, done for you in a single line. So you still pay for the full class. Um, it, should get it should get erased at runtime, but um, the compiler does generate all that for you. So this is one instance of um, minimizing the amount of handwritten code. When it comes to method handles, that's basically the same idea, but when you want to point at a particular method in your class, it will generate an object for you. So it doesn't matter what you, you don't return. You don't have to use the Java util function interfaces. If you already use Guava, you can use your Guava provider. If you, you know, have your own single interface definitions, you can use those. 
basically what the method handle will do is it'll look at the type signature. So long as the type signature of the object you are assigning to matches the type signature of the method you are referencing, it will just create a wrapper object for you. It will reference this variable correctly. It'll just generate code for you. So um, defender methods. These are interesting. This is, um, creates a new level of inheritance possible in Java. So when you have a interface, you can now specify default methods. And what this does for you is it says, I can have five different interfaces, each with a bunch of default methods. I can put all those together in one object and basically have multi-inheritance. So long as you don't actually get down to a class level, you can just start slapping all sorts of things together. Not that you should just slap all sorts of things together, but in some cases, um, for example, with web components, if you have a similar facet that you want to use in multiple places, you can create an interface for each facet and then just put them together so that, you know, um, anyone who's using a, a GWT widget right now has, is focusable and is click, or has click handlers and has this and has that, and you have to implement these interfaces yourself, this you can do in an abstract level. And um, in practice, I found it allows you to specify the, all the boilerplate and reusable code at the interface level and get that for free um, when you're coding. The only caveat that I will mention is that the current implementation of default methods actually rewrites these as static dispatch. And what that means is that the um, default method will turn into a static method with the this variable as the first parameter. So it rewrites the method parameters, stuffs the type of the interface, in this case does stuff, as the first parameter, and then it'll um, rewrite all your method calls. Now, if you have a object that actually has defined its own copy of that method, you want polymorphism to work. You want the runtime to actually call that overridden method, but if it doesn't exist, um, defer to the static one. This works great for actual classes, but when you start doing things like web components via interfaces, which I'll show you in a bit, um, it gets a little more sticky because you don't actually know at runtime what the type is, we wind up basically looking at compile time what the declared type is. So if you have at compile time specified this interface and um, this particular method, it is going to point to that static method whether you've overridden it or not. So that's a big caveat there that you need to be aware of. This is still in flux. This could very easily change before it goes production. But for anyone who does pick it up and start running with it, um, don't, ins don't expect polymorphism to work quite right yet. This is still a work in progress. So um, yeah, big, big warning there. Um, as, as another thing I'll mention, um, I use Jisney in the method hand or the um, web components. So what I do is in Jisney, it looks at the type of the interface and then grabs a method off of it, which will actually um, cr create a reference to that static method without having an, without needing an instance to find it. So I can actually send null as the parameter and it looks at compile time at the type and grabs the static method without ever actually looking at that null reference. So it's a little bit of a hack, but it was required to make beautiful things work. So I just did it. Maybe we can make it, um, maybe we can correct the polymorphism later, but for now it is what it is. So um, Java 8 versus Java 7. Here we have Java 7, you know, six lines of code to do one simple thing. Java 8, as short as JavaScript. Same thing with method handles. You know, you write all that boilerplate or you just write a method reference. Something interesting here, note the um, dot bind on the JavaScript. If you forget to do that in JavaScript, bad things are gonna happen. Because your, when you reference a function in JavaScript, it does not automatically bind the, this variable for you. It is unbound. So if you call that function without binding it or without using function dot call this argument, um, which essentially is the same kind of static method, um, you're gonna wind up having the, this variable point to the window and nasty things happen. So Java 8 is also safer than JavaScript. Um, JS interop, if you'll all stick around afterwards, Ray Crumma will give you the meaty details. I'm basically gonna show you that's as simple as it is. Um, the sum type interface, if you had that JavaScript, would just call that method or access that value natively. So you don't have to write Disney, you just have an interface. Now, this is simple for you, but this also means you have a new level of testability in your code. I don't know if anyone's ever written a unit test that tries to access native DOM elements, but that doesn't work very well. With interfaces, you can mock anything you want, you can create a actual, you know, 
Java-only implementation. Um, one thing I've been working on is having JavaFX backed by my Git widgets because I don't know if anyone's ever used JavaFX, but FXML and Git UEXML, very, very similar. Um, asking for somebody to just put them together. Haven't got there yet, but it's on the to-do list. So um, JSON drop, nothing to it. Elemental, which um, Ray Cromwell also mentioned in the keynote, basically it's just automatically generated HTML5 APIs. So whatever the WebKit or the w3.org has in the spec, it gets generated into Java interfaces, currently with JavaScript objects backing them, but in the future, it'll just be JS interop and pure interfaces for you. So if you did want to implement a JavaFX element that works as a replacement for a Gwit DOM element, you can. And you can then port your entire web application to desktop and get that for free. With the work going to JavaFX, that might be um, more useful than you know in about a year or two. Um, so really the, the core of what I'm trying to show you though is what happens when you put all this together and use it to build web components. So um, maybe you guys skip the Polymer talk, I'll give you a quick run through on how it's done in JavaScript and then pull it back into imperative Java building of a web component and then automatic generation of your web components. So what I want to do is basically make a GWT compiler where I can send in my parameters the same way I would my Eclipse or um, IntelliJ launch configuration and have it pop out a usable compile. So um, imagine this, you know, you're in development, you want to streamline your development process, you can just dump this GWT compiler element tag into your element and, or into, into your document and it'll just work. So, um, I say web components, there are four actual pieces of web components. Custom elements, which is what I really mean when I say web components. There's also HTML templates, which you can use. Um, I didn't for this example, but if you're interested in that, I mean, there's more to it. You can just look it up online. Shadow DOM, um, I experimented with it, found it was frustrating with my CSS, so I skipped it. You can use it if you really need isolation, but for purposes of a prototype, I also ignore that. And then, um, the HTML imports, which I use to pull Polymer in. So I actually use Polymer to build the bits and pieces, and then I expose those bits and pieces as new web components. So you get to see a little bit of both here. Um, so here is how to use Polymer directly in your application with a few lines of code. So first you include the script for the web components, that's the polyfill, so that whatever web browser you're using, you're gonna get web components with custom elements and your HTML imports, everything all together. Once you import paper elements, that imports core elements and Polymer and everything else. It's like 50 files, giant pile of stuff, don't do it in production. There's a tool called Vulcanize. It'll um, basically take your dependencies, compile it down to the minimum set, and emit one or two files, um, which I have done for the test app, and it worked great. There was no problems, it just worked out of the box. So. Um, once you've imported that, you can just start using paper elements in your UE binder. You can use set inner HTML. Uh, word of warning, don't do declarative web components with Polymer. If you do um, document.createElementPaperButton and then you set the raised parameter, it actually does work in the created callback and what happens is you run into race conditions. So only use set inner HTML when you're experimenting with Polymer. I asked and they said that they would be working on that, but they are trying to push people towards the faster, better way of inner HTML only. So um, that's their domain, I'm not one to intrude. So when you're creating your own custom elements in JavaScript, um, you wind up starting with first uh, prototype. So you clone any HTML element prototype you want. You can take plain HTML element, which is um, base level, or you can take an input, or you can take a file upload if you want, and you can start extending it. And so you can add callbacks, the three main callbacks being created callback, which is your constructor, the attached callback and the detached callback, which everyone who uses widgets should be very familiar with, and then um, any functions or fields that you want to add to the prototype, you can just use plain ECML, ECMA5 and either create get set pairs, which will allow you to wrap every access or assignment to your variables with a function call, which is very nice, very handy, or you can just directly dump functions onto the web component, which allows you to then use those functions in JavaScript. So 
when you want to start taking your GWT functionality, say you have an application layer built all in GWT and a GUI built in Angular, if you want to start making those talk to each other, this is the perfect way to just create something that Angular can dump, uh, you know, your tag name into the template and then access those functions and now Angular and GWT can talk nicely to each other without having to resort to hand-coded JSON methods every time you want to send data back and forth. Now, this works, you can do whatever you want. It has one huge problem, oh wait, let's do the Java way first. Uh, so when you do Java, you can do exactly the same thing, because everything you can do in JavaScript, you can do in GWT with Java. So I created a web component builder object, which essentially wraps the prototype object and allows you to assign callbacks or properties and values. Um, the properties here, I use lambda notation to make it fit on the screen. Essentially, the um, value has a lambda to return any kind of value and another lambda to set it. So that way, you can have, for example, a field somewhere that you want to mutate whenever you are setting the values. Or maybe you want to update another element every time a set is called. This allows you to just throw a function in there and because Java 8 makes functional programming easy, you don't have callback hell of eight layers of um, boilerplate to get your method call in there. So even though I don't personally like this imperative way, it works fairly well. The only real problem is right at the bottom there, you see is web component, the only method on that is element, to get the element so you can attach it to the DOM. This leaves you with no type safety whatsoever. Whatever you've added to properties and values, you don't know, it's not there. So um, I don't like it. I'd, I would rather do um, something a little simpler. Well, in my mind, simpler, it's actually more complex inside, but simpler on the outside. So we start with a, our interface is web component. We can specify different element types. Um, I'm just using plain element, but if you wanted to have your element, for example, in elemental, because they're all interfaces, you can pick an input element and get access to set checked. And you can get all of that for free without having to actually um, handle any kind of inheritance issues. It'll just work because you can cast between these objects safely. Um, the web component tag or attribute or annotation is used to supply the tag name that you want for the web component and then you just use default methods to actually supply the methods that you want. So in this case, the uncreated callback is where we're going to add some inner HTML, which as you heard me before, with Polymer works much better than imperative. I found that out the hard way. Um, so I create my elements and then I access them using either query selector or just plain DOM access and set a click handler. Nothing special, very simple, but um, uses grid.create to leverage code generator. So that way I don't write any imperative code whatsoever. All I do is define the interface and all of the methods that I want to work on the interface. And so when I'm done, you'll notice that the uh, my button is typed now. So when I add a method to it, I have access to those methods. So when I've created it, I can actually get that value and set that value in Java. So this way, Java and JavaScript both have access to the same functions. Um, using JS interop is very simple. As you see, you just annotate the type, add the properties, and now it works as a property. Um, currently what I'm doing is I'm storing it in a field. Uh, the actual value, if, you're not, if you haven't specified, goes into underscore, underscore um, bean name. And if you want to use um, oh, the attributes, I'll get to those in a second. I should have organized that a little differently. Um, so with callbacks, um, this is something that I learned a little painfully using the um, Polymer set in our HTML is that you want to use your callbacks wisely. If you can defer something until your element is attached, you probably should. In this example, um, when you have a label web component or a label facet of a web component, you want to be able to wait until it's attached to give somebody else time to create a label tag. So this way, if someone else wants a label tag in a different place, for example, you know, maybe you want your, your label tag on the left for most components and on the right for checkboxes, this allows some other facet to supply this label and this interface to actually um, implement it. So a little bit of lazy loading in there. Uh, you want to be careful, obviously, that you don't wind up using set inner HTML too much and blowing away someone else's work. Um, so another common thing we see in many web components is binding to the element's attributes. This doesn't come for free. When I put a value um, or a label property on the web component, it does not automatically read from the attribute and write to the attribute. The attribute is a string value, the property is a type value. Um, 
in order to get that, we have to do some extra code generation. And so what I do is instead of using a underscore underscore b name property, I actually use the web or use the attribute and convert to and from a string. So this does incur a little bit of cost in boxing and unboxing, but it also gives you the ability to, you know, export primitives and actually accept them through the attributes. If you change the attribute, you get a callback. The uh, the fourth web component callback is on attribute changed, and that will be triggered whenever the element's attribute is only, only when it's changed. So if you do wind up, for example, using a setter on the um, field, it'll automatically call the attribute, but if you change it in HTML, same thing. And so this gives you a single place to perform mutations in response to functions. So I would mentioned earlier, if you have a getter and a setter, you could wrap them up with functions to, to implement callbacks, but that's kind of messy because then you miss the attributes, whereas using this callback, you get access to everything. Um, now, obviously, as I mentioned before, multi-inheritance. This gives you the ability to take two different facets put them together in an interface and get everything for free. No extra work. So whenever you have something that you keep cookie cuttering out or maybe you have some kind of factory somewhere that does it for you um, or some level of um, abstraction where you have 18 layers of subclasses to be able to get to the thing you finally need, now you can get this all for free using default methods at the cost of some polymorphism because as I said, um, it looks at the type at compile time rather than at runtime. So when it comes to using prim primitives, most of it's pretty simple. I mean, you want an integer out, you just parse an in from the string, no problem. Um, long emulation, however, if anyone has dug in, is a little different because in GWT, a long object is actually a JavaScript object with a L, M, and H um, number fields, and it does big integer math. So this is not good for native JS interop. So what I did, I didn't show it here, but um, I actually create a function with a value of method. And so this way, if you try to take this object and add it to another number in JavaScript, it'll call value of, convert it to double value. You'll lose some precision, but it'll just work. So it's a bit of a compromise. If you need to keep your perfect long precision, you need to keep all of your functionality in GWT, in Java, and you probably shouldn't be exposing it in JavaScript but you can if you're willing to take the risk. Um, enum's a little simpler to turn to and from string, so long as you're not um, erasing the enum um, names from the compile, you can just use value of and name and the uh, generator will do that all for you automatically. The difficult part comes in when you want objects. So when you have an object, I have no way of knowing how you want that thing serialized or not. Um, you could probably do JavaScript object for free using JSON. I didn't for the demo, but it's available. But for everything else, we need some standardized way of doing it. So uh, I settled on using from string and to string. From string can either be static or instance level. So if it's static, it must return the type. If it's instance level, it must mutate the internal state. And it's up to you to define how to serialize to and from string but the web component will automatically map those for you. So this way, if you have your serialization format, for example, JSON, you modify the attribute, it'll actually modify the object internally so that when you call get value, you're going to get a new instance of that object. So um, it won't be the same instance, it'll be a new one. So careful with that, um, it's immutable. So uh, compiler running. So actually I had these ready to go here. Uh, can I get full screen? So basically this is just the application itself running in the browser. As you can see, it's got the uh, compiler over on the left side, a log over on the right. Internally, it is a xapi C element. You can see as you change the attribute, it changes on the screen. If you change it on the screen, it changes in the HTML, so it's bound back and forth. The, um, the container web components were generated by my code, and the internal part you see, that's Polymer, where I just dump some HTML in and attach to some event handlers. So I'm getting basically all of this for free. I use code generators for all of these types. I just looked at the runtime value of the arg handlers for the production mode, library mode, and super dev mode compilers, and it generated this set of flags. So this is all the flags in GWT 2.7. When GWT 2.8 comes out, any flags have changed, I'll just run the generator again 
and get an updated version. Um, I could obviously scaffold that to work across um, older versions, but um, not in too big of a hurry. So uh, this here will kind of demo a little bit of how one element works. So this is for the log level enum. So when it starts here, um, here's the enum. As you can see, it has a gwtc dash log level tag. It has a value on the high level or on the outer tag, which I can change. And then it also has inner um, paper polymer elements inside of it, which I can modify as well. Um, here's the interface as generated. Very simple, obviously you don't have to really, um, you only supply the minimum amount you need. You, there's never any boilerplate. It's always interfaces and functional code and nothing else. So here's a little bit of the generated code. This is where we're actually grabbing the function handle off of the tag name method. And so as you see, the Disney reference only has one parentheses at the end. That's because it's returning the function, not invoking it. It's only returning it and then it's wrapping it up in an entry and sending it back so that we can stick that on the web component now. And so when we access it in JavaScript, it calls through that method back into the generated uh, type. Here I'm passing null as I mentioned and that just works because it's not actually looking at the value. The compiler before runtime strips out the function that you need and it never actually looks at that reference. It's just there to provide context to the compiler. So um, here it just applies th that to the builder object, registers the component to the document. Um, the constructor object is just a very thin wrapper around the object that the browser returns so that when you call new component on the factory, it just actually does new uh, GWTC log level component and you get that um, return to you and because you use JS interop probably, you're going to wind up with um, all the, the methods you need pointing to JavaScript functions that exist because you put them there so it, it all just matches up. In Java, when you have a default method, it will actually defer to Java code whereas in the web component, it'll look actually on the element. So you need to be careful there as well. When you're running it from Java, it is doing the Java polymorphism trick where it extends the static method. So if you took that element and then in JavaScript changed that function somehow or wrapped it with something, it, right now as it is, you wouldn't see that. We're not actually calling um, into the JavaScript for default methods. For uh, JS interop, we are though. So um, this one is a little more complex. You might want to watch this one later on your own, but basically this is the full life cycle. This is the module load. Really all I'm doing is um, making sure to reference my factory and the XAPI GWT C tag is in the host page, which I forgot to show. This is the generated code. So this is what it takes to dump all of those um, attributes and elements onto the page. So I debugged each part of it separately and then in the end it's, you know, 1200 lines of code that I didn't have to write myself by hand or maintain myself so that when things update, I don't look at it, I just delete it, generate a new one. So the only real functionality is in the compile button. The compile button says, hey, when you're on clicked, let's go to the server and uh, start a compile. So we send a post message to our IO server and that's going to use uh, Java servlet 3.0 asynchronous context. So here we do a post and grabs a compile request, adds it to our queue, and um, sends back a key so we can listen to it later. In the compile request, it's not really um, too clear here while I'm scrolling through, but really it's just an executor that's creating a class loader to run the compile, and the compile uses a uh, tree logger that just spits strings back into the queue, and the queue goes here, uh, I'll, I'll wait till it catches up, but basically, um, I used the class path on the server. I could have had it so you specify your own class path. Eh, I didn't really have time, so I didn't do that. It's a future enhancement, put it on the backlog. Um, but suffice to say, I actually used the arg hand, like the um, arg processor that GWT compiler uses. I used the same thing. I used it to generate the um, web components and then the product of the web components goes back to the same object. So that way I can draw my unit test and it just works. So when the logger spits out messages, it uses the um, servlet 3.0 to print messages to the event source, event source listens to them and logs them. That's the entire thing, all in a like two minute video that I'm sure no one really followed. But um, if you do decide to download the source and have a look at it, now at least you have a little guide of like, 
here it is going here, here it is going there. Um, I'm going to automate more of it in the future if I get to use this in production anywhere. So um, I've got a little bit of time left, so I prepared a couple bonus slides. Now, these bonus slides come with some big caveats. These are um, little bits of functionality that I have added to the GWT compiler. So you don't get these for free. If you want these, you have to use my modified GWT SDK, and um, you're, you're going to have to wait a little bit until I can get it pushed to Maven Central to use it without recompiling yourself. So um, really, this is more of a proof of concept for something to see if we want to add this to the GWT SDK or not. Um, it uses something I call magic method injection, which is essentially my own version of GWT.create. So this method at the bottom, xhtml.injectcss, um, allows me to specify a class and a CSS service, and it will inject the CSS we see here. And so the annotation allows you to specify a resource bundle or directly create style elements with a style tag. Um, this has JavaFX in mind as well, because JavaFX also uses CSS. So my goal here is that this is an abstract way of saying, okay, I have an interface that I want to use, and it's got some CSS attached to it, so I want to um, do all of this automatically for me. So the WIC compiler actually takes this inject CSS method, uses it to trigger a code generator that actually um, transforms this method call into a, a different method call entirely, which um, accepts the elemental service. So the any type at all class, same rules as um, standard would create in that it must be a class literal. Um, I fixed it a little bit so that it can actually be a field reference to a class literal or a method where the return statement is a direct reference of a field um, or a final variable. So you get a little more leniency on where it comes from, but it has to resolve to a constant at compile time. And so um, I've been using this with my web component such that if I include the CSS tag on the web component, it'll automatically inject the CSS at the same time. What this means is I have now a single place where I can define my default methods, define all my callbacks, add the CSS that I want, export my class names, and it's all in one place. It's in an interface. It's all public, so nothing is hidden. You're never going to wind up with, oh, why did they make that protected? Um, I know that people... The purists would say that we should probably be making things as protected as possible to help the compiler inline, but when you're using JS interop, you don't want inlining. You actually want to expose all of that, because even if you don't reference it in Java, you need it to be attached to that element so that if somebody is using it, all the functionality is there, whether you referenced it in your code or not. That's why my entry point only references the field that um, contains the factory. I don't need to do anything else. Once it's referenced, it's all included. I get it for free. Um, this one, I'm a little less sure that it's going to survive because I've heard a lot of rumors of better tools coming along. But I've been using this myself just as an experiment to um, annotate my own um, templates onto objects. So the interface itself can have an HTML annotation, which itself can specify the tag name and specify style objects and element objects and a boilerplate for the whole container. And then each individual method can also specify its own templating. So this allows you to create more complex scenarios where now your interface is supplying the functionality. It's also supplying the template used to stamp out the element needed to provide that functionality. So um, you do wind up with much larger interfaces, but the beauty is that because they're interfaces, you can implement them any way you want, and you don't lose the ability to unit test them. Um, you're mocking, you might have to get a little fancy with it, but um, you can still, at the end of the day, uh, create all of your web components using multi-inheritance and then just pushing each piece together. So once again, um, magic method to inject the types. Um, and I guess I wrapped up a little bit early, so I've got a full 10 minutes to take questions if there are any. Um, I'm also available to talk anytime afterwards. I maintain the Java 8 fork, so if you're interested in getting it up and running, I will help you with that. It's pretty simple. Just check out source and elemental disk dev. You should be there. Whew. No? All right, then.